This is True Crime Out Loud. I'm your host, B. And I'm your host, Jen. And this is part two of our series on Charles Manson and the Manson family. And we're going to start with a brief summary of what we talked about in episode one. And we covered Charles Manson from his birth up to the creation of the Manson family and kind of discussed the bios of significant Manson family members. In this episode, we're going to talk about more members of the Manson family, the daily life and the living situation of the family. We're also going to delve into the crimes of Manson and his family that they're so infamous for. We all wonder how in the world Charles Manson got these followers. The story of Diane Lake, it helps explain her journey into the Manson family so you can kind of get an idea of how these people got involved. So we're going to go back to 1967. It was known as the Summer of Love. This is the year Manson went to San Francisco and began to create his family. Now, it was dubbed the Summer of Love by the media to explain the exponential growth of the hippie movement based around San Francisco and particularly the Haight-Ashbury area. It was reported that over 100,000 young people went to San Francisco that summer. Communes were on the rise and people were wanting to live this so-called simpler way of life. Diane Lake was a 14-year-old girl who had grown up in Minneapolis, Minnesota in a housing project. Diane's parents moved the family to California to live on a commune, and this was not Manson's commune. Living the commune life, Diane quit school at 14. She wanted to continue with this free lifestyle and had the encouragement and support of her parents. So Diane's a young girl in the height of of the summer of love and she's looking to party. So during this summer of love, Diane meets Charles Manson and she became part of his family for two years. Diane's parents were okay with Diane doing this. Diane says orgies and LSD use were very methodically done with Manson. She said LSD was given out like a sacrament. Then they would take turns taking each other's clothes off in a circle and he orchestrated all of it. He even arranged who would be partners. Their orgies were called love-ins, and their purpose was to keep down the fighting between the female members. Lake was actually the one put in charge of delivering Susan Atkins' son in October of 1968. She gave birth in a room on Spawn Ranch, which we're gonna cover here in a minute. Manson had told Lake to cut the umbilical cord with her teeth, so she did. Now, Manson was not supposedly the father of this child, but he named the baby Zazosi Zadfrak Glutz, a baby boy. Lake was not part of the later conspiracy on murders because she was on the outs with the inner circle of Manson at that time. She said Manson had left the ranch for an extended period of time, so she left, which went against Manson's order. She was not supposed to leave. Lake said Manson was instilling this fear against African-American people, and she herself was becoming fearful of them. When police started arresting members of the family, Lake was one of those arrested. She finally revealed her age to police and she was taken out of a jail cell and sent to a psychiatric hospital. She decided to be one of the ones to testify against Manson and the other family members. Lake actually went on to have a career in special education and has basically lived unknown for many, many years. So I guess an associate of Charles Manson, now we might even call him a fringe member, but not quite. He never lived on the ranch was someone who was very famous for the time, and that was Dennis Wilson of the Beach Boys. In episode one, we told you that the Manson family just kind of traveled around aimlessly, sleeping wherever they wanted or wherever they could. But in 1968, they got kind of a lucky break. They met Dennis Wilson. 
And as most of you may know, Dennis Wilson was one of the members of a very famous band at the time, the Beach Boys, founded in 1960. They were known for their songs Kokomo, Wouldn't It Be Nice, I Get Around, and Good Vibrations. They were at the top of their game at this time, which was what makes this such an interesting part of the story. Now, the Beach Boys, the band, was comprised of brothers Brian, Dennis, and Carl Wilson, and their cousin Mike Love, also with their friend Al Jardine. Dennis Wilson was the drummer of the band and actually the only one of the Beach Boys who knew how to surf, which I think is kind of funny. He was also the pretty boy of the band. And in the summer of 1968, Wilson had just divorced his first wife, Carol, and was living in a home on Sunset Boulevard. That summer, Dennis Wilson picked up two female hitchhikers while driving along the Pacific Coast Highway in Malibu. But these hitchhikers were no ordinary hitchhikers. They were two members of the Manson family, Patricia Krenwinkel and Ella Jo Bailey. Wilson brought the two women back to his home on Sunset Boulevard, and these women began telling Wilson of their spiritual guru and his great knowledge. And Wilson, this intrigued Wilson because he himself was interested in meditation and hippie culture. So one day, Manson and other family members just show up at Wilson's home. Manson and about 20 of his family members are end up staying in Wilson's home. Manson even managed to convince Wilson that the main home would be best for him and the family, so Wilson moved into the guest house that was on the property. The Manson family often used Wilson's Rolls Royce to go dumpster diving. Wilson loved Manson's music. And he said that he saw great potential musically in Manson. Now, friends of Wilson said that he tended to kind of find the misfits of society and was drawn to them. And they, in turn, were, were drawn to him. And I'm sure this was the case with the Manson family. I mean, these none of the family members ever bathe regularly, kind of hygiene issues. And here's this famous rock musician. It's kind of a, a weird couple, I guess you would say. Wilson's other friends, they didn't really care for Manson, but they respected Wilson and his status. Manson actually recorded a demo at Brian Wilson's recording studio, and like I mentioned before, Brian Wilson's another member of the Beach Boys and Dennis Wilson's brother. And Manson's song was called Look at Your Game, Girl. And you can actually go online and listen to that recording. You can hear Manson's voice singing that song. Wilson called Manson the wizard, and he began even introducing Manson to other influential people in Hollywood and started taking him to these Hollywood parties. He told Manson, and he did want to, in fact, introduce Manson to Terry Melcher and Greg Jacobson. Now, Melcher was a producer at Columbia Records, and Jacobson was a songwriter and close friend of Dennis Wilson. Wilson told Manson that Melcher would love him and his music, so at a party, Wilson introduced him. Melcher actually came out and listened to Manson and the Manson family, and this was a big, big thing for Manson. He really wanted this recording contract, but Melcher kind of blew him off and told Manson that he would get back to him, and he never really did. And by this point, Wilson has kind of become disillusioned with Manson and the family. He's a famous musician. He's kind of got his own thing going, and he's now got this commune living at his house. During the time that the family lived with Wilson, he had spent a lot of money, including fees and medical treatment for all kinds of stuff, including rampant gonorrhea that was circulating amongst the members. Wilson's accountant called him and told him that the milk being delivered to the home had racked up a $1,200 bill that needed to be paid. So the Manson family, during their short stay with Dennis Wilson, had racked up a $1,200 bill for milk home delivery. Wilson finally got the hint that he was being taken advantage of. He got a friend to get his personal belongings from his home and told this friend not to let Manson or the rest of the Manson family know where he was. 
Dennis Wilson and the Beach Boys were gearing up to go on the road, so Wilson just kind of abandoned his home and left Manson and the family to live there, knowing that the lease was about to run out on the home. Wilson actually picked up and moved, essentially. He moved into another home. So Manson, still desiring this recording deal, led him to try to track Melcher down again, and he knew that Melcher lived at the home on Cielo Drive. Manson went to the home on Cielo Drive looking for Melcher and was actually escorted off the property by a photographer friend of the home's new occupant, Sharon Tate, and her husband, Roman Polanski. Wilson had previously told Manson that one of his songs would be on their upcoming Beach Boy album titled 2020. In 1969, the Beach Boys released the song Bluebirds Over the Mountain, and they released that as a single. The B-side of that release was a song called Never Learn Not to Love. This song was actually written by Charles Manson and was called Cease to Exist. They changed the name and edited the song, and Wilson took credit for it. It was later reported that other members of the Beach Boys thought Dennis Wilson wrote the song, and they had no idea that Charles Manson had really written it. And for our younger listeners... If you're not sure what a B-side is, that is the side of the album that you never really listen to. So you have the hit song on one side, and you have the way, way, way less popular song that no one remembers or even listens to once or twice on the B-side. So Dennis Wilson basically, I don't want to say stole Charles Manson's song, but he definitely borrowed it, I guess we should say, and this infuriated Manson. He was very angry that he did not receive the credit that he felt he was due for the song, and he decided to again pay Wilson a visit. So when Manson goes to Wilson's new home, he doesn't see Wilson, who's not there, but he sees one of Wilson's friends, and he leaves a bullet at the house and makes sure that the friend knows how important it is for Wilson to keep his children safe. During the summer of 1968, we just told you how the Manson family was living with Dennis Wilson. But also during this time, the family was beginning to occupy another location. This location was about 25 miles from downtown Los Angeles, but it was still isolated. This place was called Spawn Ranch, and Spawn is spelled S-P-A-H-N. Susan Atkins, who Manson had renamed Sadie, is the one who discovered Spawn Ranch. The ranch was owned by an elderly man named George Spawn, who was mostly blind. He was already in his 80s when he met Manson and the family. Spawn was a dairy farmer who bought the ranch in 1948, and the ranch was used as a movie set for Western movies like Bonanza and The Lone Ranger. But by 1960, it was no longer used for that purpose. It was more of a rundown movie set than an actual ranch, but it had a saloon, stables, and cabins, and some horses. And Spawn would rent these horses out for riding. The family started moving there gradually. George Spawn liked Manson. He thought he was an interesting guy. And George Spawn liked having companionship. George Spawn lived in a small house near the entrance to the ranch. Now, Mr. Spawn would let the Manson family stay there for free in return for them cleaning the barns and other chores around the ranch. The Manson girls took care of George and kept him from being lonely. Now, it's been disputed that the girls would have sex with Mr. Spawn, but they did help care for him, such as cooking and cleaning. Lynette Squeaky Frome was Spawn's favorite, and he's the one who actually gave her the nickname Squeaky because she would squeak when he pinched her thighs. Frome later said she really liked Mr. Spawn because he reminded her of her grandfather. The ranch was very isolated, like I said, and this in turn isolated the family from the outside world, so think no books or clocks or calendars. It became their own world where they would rely heavily on one another to live. The location and the setup of the ranch allowed the family to set up this commune-style existence. 
Former family members say it was a very peaceful time during the first part of their stay on the ranch. They even had a bakery that would bring the family their day-old goods. They would go dumpster diving for other food because they said people throw out good food. Spring of 1969 is when things began to change and Manson started becoming more paranoid. The isolation and reliance on each other is what fed into the paranoia of Manson and it also fed into him projecting this onto his family members where they were becoming more paranoid. In the spring, there were also new people involved with the family. One example of that is the Straight Satan's motorcycle gang. In the summer of 1969, there were 32 adults and seven children living on Spawn Ranch. So what was a typical day like on Spawn Ranch? Well, like I said, it's a communal type living where everybody pitched in and everybody cared for each other. On a typical day, Manson would gather the family, he would play his guitar, tell stories, and people would dance around. Members say the family would drop acid two to four times a week. However, Manson would give it to the family members, and then he would take smaller doses or none at all for himself. He would dictate what everyone else did, such as who had sex with who. When a new girl would join, he would have her have sex with another one of the girls, and he would do the same with the boys. When they were on acid trips, he would try to get into their inhibitions and get them to let go of those. He wanted to get rid of their morals and try to remove those. He wanted them to lose their egos in order to free themselves. Now, that's what he told them, but this was more so so he could control them. It was described as like a group marriage with blurred lines. All of the family members were into music and they loved to play and hear it every night. Their acid trips for some of the members were said to be around 250 to 500 times. And Manson, he got all the sex he wanted with whoever he wanted. He was the guru of the family. And like I said, the women just loved being around his music. Manson initiated what he called creepy crawlies with his slippies. So those are two of the terms Manson created. He called himself and the family members slippies with an S, which was a play on the term hippies. And because they were slipping around during these creepy crawlies. The creepy crawlies is where the family would enter an occupied home at night while people were sleeping and they would rearrange their furniture or just take minor items. Manson had convinced his family he was the second coming of Christ and began to preach helter-skelter to his followers. So what is helter-skelter? Well, in 1968, Manson's love for music took a strange and obsessive turn with the Beatles' release of their White Album. He became totally obsessed with it, particularly the song Helter Skelter. He told his followers that it had to do with the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Manson said that he was the second coming of Christ and Armageddon was coming, and he based that off of this song. And he believed that this second coming of Christ and Armageddon was going to involve a racial war. He said that the black man was going to rise up and the white man was going down. Manson claimed that cities were going to burn and that the African-American or black man would come out on top. The family was not going to be part of the Armageddon because Manson claimed that they would be needed after the war ended. And only the chosen ones would survive this war, and that they, in fact, were the chosen ones as the Manson family. Now, Manson stated that during this war, he was going to take his family underground to the bottomless pit in the desert, where it was a land of milk and honey. After the world was taken over by, quote, blackie, that's what Manson referred to African-American males as, he believed that they would not be able to handle the reins of power, and so Manson and his family could return from the bottomless pit in the desert to 
rule the world after they had failed. In the end, Manson believed that his family would be the one who ruled the world. Now, how did he know all this? What is he basing this off of? Well, he said that he listened to the White Album by the Beatles over and over and over again, and most of the messages came from the song Helter Skelter. But he claimed that every song on the White Album had some link to him and his family. Manson said that Helter Skelter was going to represent the final war on Earth. Manson even did an interview with Rolling Stone in 1970 and said that the Beatles were telling it like it is. Helter Skelter is coming down. He said that, quote, the Beatles know in the sense of what the subconscious knows. Now, whatever that's supposed to mean. We will see throughout this entire thing that he rambles about a lot of stuff that makes no sense to anyone, any normal person. By June of 1969, Manson is preaching this message of Helter Skelter almost every day. And prior to this obsession with Helter Skelter and this impending race war that he's claiming is going to happen, all he cared about was sex and orgies and drugs. The family actually sent letters to the Beatles to have them join the Manson family before the race war, but of course the Beatles didn't respond to the Manson family requests. Manson said he knew that the Beatles were just programming black people to start the uprising. Manson said they would need an army to help with this mission, and they wanted to enlist the help of the motorcycle gang, the Straight Satans. And this is the same group that Jen mentioned as kind of hanging around Spawn Ranch earlier. His plan was to use the women of his family to attract the gang and kind of bring them into the fold. Now, Danny DiCarlo, who was known as Donkey Dan, was the treasurer of the Straight Satans, and he was from Canada, and he had actually stayed at Spawn Ranch for a while. And he stayed because of this abundance of girls, sex, and drugs. In 1966, he had been convicted of smuggling marijuana across the U.S.-Mexico border. However, the other members of the Straight Satans didn't like him much at all and wanted to get Donkey Dan out of the ranch and back to the club. So the gang shows up at the ranch to retrieve their treasurer, Donkey Dan, and they're pretty much freaked out by how Manson's acting, and so they leave without him. Donkey Dan was actually on scene at the ranch during the August 16th raid that we'll talk about later. He was later charged with three crimes, but he made a deal with the prosecution to tell all he knew about Manson and the family, and he actually did testify before a grand jury. After his testimony, Donkey Dan repatriated back to Canada and is now deceased. So by June and July of 1969, as I mentioned before, Manson is pushing this message of Helter Skelter, and he's becoming increasingly more angry and more paranoid and pushing this message constantly and daily. On one occasion, he even beat Gypsy, one of the family members we discussed in part one, and he kicked her and just beat her up, and she had no idea why. And it was attributed to this increase in his anger and paranoia. The family already did what Manson wanted at this point because of manipulation and that kind of thing, but at this point, now they're afraid of him, and and his behavior was actually instilling terror and fear into the members, but they stayed. And so was that out of fear? Maybe. But they also believed what he preached in a lot of cases. He had talked about it so much that these members of the family who have been manipulated and groomed by him, they believed that cities were going to burn that people were going to shoot and kill each other. And the only way for them to survive is for them to stay together. And all the happiness and the good times and all of that, that everyone once enjoyed, what made Spawn Ranch such a great place to them, had disappeared. Even the music wasn't happening much anymore. And they ran into money problems. They needed money to survive. Which brings us to Gary Hinman. He was an associate of the Manson family. Gary Hinman was a music teacher who lived in Topanga Canyon. 
He also furnished drugs for the family in order to make a little extra side money. He wasn't a big time dealer, but he would get drugs for them when they needed them. Now, there's various stories about the events involving Gary Hinman. One story is Manson sent Bobby Beausoleil and Susan Atkins to Hinman's home to get money from him. Manson targeted Hinman for money because he believed Hinman had inherited several thousands of dollars. Now, Beausoleil, years later in jail, said he had actually gotten some mescaline from Hinman and he gave it to the straight Satans. But they took it and they had mixed it with other drugs. It made them all sick and they didn't like it and they wanted their money back. So Beausoleil and Atkins went to get it. Either story you go with puts Bobby Beausoleil and Susan Atkins at Hinman's home. Bruce Davis drove Manson, Beausoleil, and Atkins to Gary Hinman's home. But Bruce Davis and Charles Manson left. But Hinman didn't have any money. He had a few dollars in cash and even showed Beausoleil his checkbook where he barely had any money in there. He signed over the title to a rundown junk car that he had and his other car, which was not such a great vehicle either. But they didn't know what to do next. I mean, Bobby wasn't able to get money from him. So Atkins calls Manson, who is already back at the ranch. So Manson returns to Hinman's house with a sword. And he told Hinman that he owed him money. But when Hinman kept insisting he didn't have any, Manson sliced off part of Hinman's ear with a sword while Bruce Davis held a gun on him. Manson leaves that sword with Beausoleil and tells him that he knew what he needed to do and to make it look like the Blackies did it. This was also part of Manson's plan. He had told his family that the black man wasn't smart enough to know how to start the war so the Manson family needed to show them how to do it. So two days of Bobby Beausoleil and Susan Atkins staying in the home with Hinman after he's had his ear sliced off, Bobby kills him. He stabbed him with a knife, and then he used Hinman's blood to make a paw print on the wall. And this paw print was meant to represent the Black Panthers. He also wrote political piggies on the wall, and this was to represent the white establishment. Beausoleil actually leaves Hinman's home in the one vehicle that worked, and he brought with him the knife he had used to kill Hinman. Hinman's body was found on July 31st of 1969. Now that car Beausoleil was in didn't make it very far before it broke down and the police stopped to help. It didn't take them long to realize that this vehicle belonged to a murder victim. Beausoleil was found with bloody clothes on his body and a bloody murder weapon with him. He was arrested on suspicion of the murder of Gary Hinman on August 6th of 1969. This was the turning point for Manson, though. He realized that he could get these young men and women to murder whoever he said to murder. And that brings us to the crime that Manson and his family are most commonly associated with, and those are going to be the murders that occurred at 10050 Cielo Drive. And before we get into the crime itself, I think we owe it to the victims to kind of tell the listeners about them. And they were some very famous and influential people at the time, or related to very famous and influential people at the time. It's always struck me with this story that we've got the Beach Boys involved and we've got a, another actress involved. I mean, it's like these hippies are able to mingle with some of Los Angeles is elite. And at the top of that list was Sharon Tate. She was an up and coming young actress known as just beautiful. I mean, she, she was, her career was on the rise. She was born in Dallas, Texas in 1943 to an army family where they eventually moved to Italy and Sharon attended an American high school there. Sharon had won several beauty pageants and was crowned homecoming and prom queen. 
She started her acting career in 1963 with small parts in The Beverly Hillbillies and Mr. Ed. She had collaborated with Roman Polanski on the 1967 movie The Fearless Vampire Killers, and she actually married Polanski on January 20th, 1968. She and Roman had a different view on love than what was commonly accepted at the time. She wanted to follow the free love lifestyle, but she was not fully embracing it. Roman did, in fact, embrace the free love lifestyle. Sharon even told journalist Peter Evans, We have a good arrangement. Roman lies to me, and I pretend to believe him. During the murders, Polanski was away in London and set to return home in a few days. Sharon Tate was eight months pregnant with Polanski's child, and this was the first child for both of them. Sharon Tate was 26 years old at the time of the crime. Also at the house on Cielo Drive was Jay Sebring, famous hairdresser to the Hollywood elite of the time. Sebring had been Sharon's boyfriend, but they had separated because he routinely cheated on her, and it was not seen as a great relationship, although they remained very good friends after her and Roman Polanski started their relationship. Also at the residence was Abigail Folger and Wojtek Ferkowski. Folger was called Gibby by her family, and she was 25 at the time of the crimes. Her 26th birthday was two days after the crime. She was the great-granddaughter of J.A. Folger, which may sound familiar, and it should, because J.A. Folger is the founder of Folger's Coffee. She was, in fact, the heir to the Folger Empire. Her father was Peter Folger, and at the time of the crimes, he was chairman of the Folger Coffee Company. Abigail had graduated college with an art history degree, having attended Ratcliffe College and Harvard University, and she worked at the University of California Art Museum in Berkeley. She also spent some time in New York and had worked at a bookstore and then as a volunteer social worker for the L.A. County Welfare Department. And in 1968, she had met Wojtek Ferkowski. They had rented a home together in Hollywood, and she was pretty well off. Her reported income from her piece of her inheritance was $130,000 a year after taxes. This is 1969, so lot, that's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. In 1968, she invested $3,500 of that money in Sebring International. That's a J. Sebring's hair care line. J. Sebring, who was also at the house that I just told you about. Now, as I mentioned, Abigail's boyfriend's name was Wojtek Ferkowski, and he was an acquaintance of Roman Polanski. Wojtek was born in Poland, and at the time of the crimes, he had a 12-year-old son. Wojtek himself was 33 at the time of the murder. He was new to the U.S. in 1968 when he met Abigail Folger, and he was an aspiring writer. Shortly after meeting Abigail, he became enamored with her and pretty much immediately moved into Abigail's apartment. And Abigail began to financially support him while he pursued his writing career. It was reported that their relationship was kind of rocky and that they argued constantly. Wojtek was known to use cocaine, mescaline, marijuana, and LSD. On April 1st, 1969, Abigail quit her job, and she and Wojtek moved into the Tate Polanski home to house sit. And I know what you're thinking. You're probably thinking, okay, well, why is Sharon Tate the owner of the home? Why is she there? And so are the house sitters. Well, at the time of the crimes, Sharon Tate had been home for about three weeks, but her husband, Roman Polanski, had asked Abigail and Wojtek to stay there with her since she's pregnant until he returned. He was set to return on August 12th, and that ended up being three days after the murders took place. And finally, at the scene on Cielo Drive, was Stephen Parent. And he was a friend of a caretaker, William Gerritsen, who had been visiting him that night. He had just graduated high school in 1969 and was 18 years old. He had been to visit Gerritsen and was trying to sell him a clock radio. He was driving his father's 1966 White Nash Ambassador. 
So just after 9 p.m. on August 8, 1969, Sharon Tate, Jay Sebring, Abigail Folger, and Wojtek Frakowski had gone out to eat Mexican food at El Coyote Restaurant and then returned to the Tate Polanski home. Abigail spoke to her mom about 10 p.m. that night, confirming that she would be flying out the next morning to celebrate her 26th birthday with her mom. Stephen Parent had arrived at the property at about 11.45 p.m. to visit that caretaker, and he drank a beer with Gerritsen and began to leave the property at about 12.15 a.m. early on August 9th, 1969. A lot of the information about the murders at 10050 CLO Drive comes from the testimony of Linda Kasabian, who we discussed in part one as being a Manson family member, from the trial. And then later we get details from those who were involved in the crimes. Linda Kasabian said she thought they were going on a creepy crawly mission. Katie, which was Patricia Krenwinkle, and Sadie, Susan Atkins, were in the back seat of the car, and they seemed excited that they were picked for this mission. Kasabian said she felt special, although she didn't know where they were going at the time. Before they left Spawn Ranch, they all took some speed. Before they headed out in the car, Manson told them to do something witchy. When they arrived at the home, the lights were on outside and the driveway was lit up. Tex Watson, who was driving, got out and got rope from the trunk of the car along with wire cutters. Tex first cut the phone lines, but then he saw a car coming down the driveway. They all hid, but Tex jumped out and startled the driver of that car. He then shot the driver four times, and this was Stephen Parent. The victim was slumped over in the car, and Tex told Kasabian to get his wallet, so she did. As they all approached the home, Kasabian was directed to go to the back of the house, while Tex, Krenwinkel, and Atkins went to the front of the home. Tex told Kasabian to stay outside. Kasabian said the back of the home was secure, so she came back to the front of the home, and she could hear screaming and then heard a gunshot. Susan Atkins came out of the house and told Kasabian to listen for sounds. So Kasabian took this to mean that she was the lookout. She then said a man with blood on his face came stumbling out of the home and Kasabian looked him directly in the eyes. She knew that this man was dying as he stumbled. This was Wojtek Frykowski. Tex came running after the man and stabbed him while he lay on the ground over and over and over again. Then Kasabian saw a woman in a white dress with blood all over it come running out of the house and was yelling for her mother. This was Abigail Folger. She then saw Krenwinkel chase after Abigail Folger and began to stab her. Kasabian said she felt like it was an out-of-body experience, so she went back down to the hill and went to the car and waited. Finally, the other three came back to the car, and they were covered in blood. She said Tex was angry with her. Krenwinkel, Atkins, and Tex Watson gave their bloody clothing to Kasabian, along with the knives and gun. She wiped the prints off of the knives and the gun before tossing them out of the car window. She said Krenwinkel was complaining about her hand hurting. She said the bones in the woman got in the way of the stabbing and it was making her hand hurt. Tex Watson later said that the four victims in the house were running around like chickens with their heads cut off, which is a very southern phrase, just meaning it was very frenzied. The group makes it back to Spawn Ranch and Manson was outside waiting on them. He asked Kasabian if she had any remorse and she wasn't even sure what that word meant, so she didn't know if she had remorse or not. The next day, they saw the murders of five people on the news, and it said that Sharon Tate was found with a rope around her neck and was eight months pregnant. Kasabian said this is the first time that she learned that Tate was pregnant. 
Around 8.30 a.m. on August 9th, housekeeper Winifred Chapman arrived to work at the Tate Polanski home and found the victims. Sharon Tate was on the living room floor with a rope wrapped around her neck and numerous stab wounds. Jay Sebring was covered in blood and the rope that had been around Sharon's neck was across a beam in the ceiling and the other end was around Jay's neck. He had a bloody towel on his face and head. Abigail Folger and Wojtek Frykowski were on the lawn about 50 feet apart and covered in blood. The word pig was written on the front door in blood. There was a bloodied boy behind the wheel of a car. When police arrived, they found one person still alive, William Gerritsen, the caretaker of the property. He was named as prime suspect and interrogated by police. Now, he eventually took a polygraph, passed it, and was released. And from the autopsies of the victims, we learn what they suffered. And I actually have links to these autopsies on our website. Stephen Parent was shot four times. Jay Sebring was stabbed seven times in the chest and back and shot in the left side of his chest. He had abrasions and contusions to his face and a bloody towel over his face and head. Sharon Tate was stabbed in the chest four times, in the back eight times, once in the abdomen, once in the right upper arm, once in the left upper arm, once on the back of the right thigh, two lacerations to her left forearm. So in total, she was stabbed 16 times and slashed twice and hanged. She had rope burns on her cheek from the rope that was tied around her neck. Her cause of death was multiple stab wounds penetrating the heart and lungs, causing massive hemorrhaging. The quarter said Tate had been suspended by the rope as she was dying during the agonal state or during the dying process. Abigail Folger was stabbed multiple times. She had wounds to the face, neck, thorax, abdomen, and extremities. She had defensive wounds on her arm and right hand. Her autopsy describes 28 stab wounds, and the cause of death was a stab wound to the aorta. Wojtek Frykowski had 13 lacerations to the top of his head caused from being hit in the head with the butt of a revolver. Five stab wounds to his back, 11 stab wounds to his trunk, 16 stab wounds to the left arm, 3 stab wounds to the left hand, 8 stab wounds to the left leg, 3 stab wounds to the right arm, 5 defensive wounds to the right hand, gunshot wound to the back, and 1 to the left thigh. In total, he had 51 stab wounds, 13 lacerations, and 2 gunshot wounds. Later, Atkins tells someone that she had thought about cutting the baby out of Sharon Tate. Atkins is the one who used Sharon Tate's blood to write the word pig in big letters on the front door. Police did find marijuana, hashish, cocaine, and MDA in the home. There was about three ounces of marijuana in the living room cabinet and a small amount in Sebring's car. Cocaine was found in Sebring's car. Hashish and MDA were found in the front bedroom that had been occupied by Abigail and Wojtek. So a horrible, horrible, bloody scene. But I guess Manson wasn't sure that this was going to be enough to kick off Helter Skelter. And that leads us to Rosemary and Lino LaBianca. Lino was a first-generation American born of Italian immigrants. He was a World War II veteran and a track star in high school. He actually owned Gateway Markets, a small supermarket chain in Los Angeles. In 1959, he met his second wife, Rosemary Struthers, and they had quickly gotten married. Rosemary had been raised in an orphanage in Arizona, but was born in Mexico. At the age of 12, she was adopted. She was working as a car hop in Los Feliz when she met her first husband, Frank Struthers, and they had two kids together. When her and Lino married, she opened a boutique. In 1968, they moved into Lino's childhood home at 3301 Waverly Drive, Los Angeles, located in the Los Feliz district. 
Weeks before the murders, Rosemary had told a friend that someone had been coming in their house while they were gone and that some of their things had been moved around and gone through. Saturday, August 9th, 1969, Rosemary and Lino had spent most of the day with Rosemary's kids at Lake Isabella, about 150 miles from Los Angeles. Rosemary's daughter, Susan Struthers, was an adult, but her son, Frank Struthers Jr., was only 16. Frank Jr. had been spending the weekend with a friend at the lake, so Lino and Rosemary had driven out there to visit them. They arrived home on Waverly Drive in the early morning hours of August 10th. Lino went to sleep on the sofa, and Rosemary went into the bedroom. And as the LaBiancas are preparing to go to bed for the night, Manson is picking the people for his next mission. That night, Kasabian was picked to go on the mission, and she knew that this would be another mission involving murder. Tex Watson, Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, Linda Kasabian, Leslie Van Houten, Steve Grogan, and Manson all got into a white 1959 Ford Galaxy that was owned by a Spawn Ranch ranch hand named John Schwartz. They drove around randomly looking for victims in Los Angeles. This was the first time that Manson was with them. He went with them because he said the night before they were too messy and he was going to show them how to do it. Manson had with him a sword or bayonet and a gun. They went to 3301 Waverly Drive, the LaBiancas' home. The family members had no previous experiences with the LaBiancas other than that they had been to a drug party next door to the LaBianca home about a year prior to the murders. At the home, there was a green Ford Thunderbird and a speedboat parked out front. Manson went inside the home first and tied up the LaBiancas. He did this while everyone else waited in the car. Manson returned to the car, retrieved Tex Watson, and then they re-entered the home through an unlocked back door. Manson held a gun on Lino LaBianca and told him that he was not going to be hurt and that they were only after his money. Manson took Rosemary's wallet from her purse and left the home. He told Krenwinkel and Van Houten to enter the home with Watson. The LaBiancas had their hands tied behind their backs, and prior to leaving, Manson gave those on the mission instructions to kill and then find their own way home. These Manson family members inside the home closed the blinds and got an 8-inch serrated kitchen knife and a twin-tined carving fork from the kitchen drawer. Tex Watson placed pillowcases over the heads of Lino and Rosemary LaBianca and used lamp cords to gag them. Tex opened Lino's shirt and stabbed him in the throat with a bayonet-type sword given to him by Manson. He did this 12 times. Rosemary heard her husband's screams and she began to struggle when Tex went running in and stabbed her several times. Manson had instructed all of the members to get their hands dirty, so Krenwinkel did so by stabbing Rosemary with a kitchen knife while she was dying. Tex handed Van Houten his blade and she stabbed Rosemary an additional 16 times in her lower back. While the murders were taking place inside the LaBianca home, Manson left the area with Kasabian, Clem, and Atkins still in the car. About 8.30 p.m. on August 10th, Frank Jr. returned to the home. He knocked on the back door, but no one came to the door to let him in, so he walked down the street and called his sister. About 10.30 p.m., his sister Susan and her fiancé, Joe Dorgan, arrived at the home. They were able to get a house key from Lino's car, which had been unlocked in the driveway. When they entered, they found Lino in a crouched position in the living room, his head covered in a white pillowcase. Lino had 26 stab wounds with a knife left protruding from his body and a fork left protruding from his body as well. Krenwinkel had carved the word war onto Lino's stomach. Rosemary had a total of 41 stab wounds, 13 of which had been determined to be post-mortem. Van Houten had continued to stab Rosemary after she had already died. Each victim was found with their hands tied behind their backs, pillowcases over their heads, and cords from lamps wrapped tightly around their necks. The words Helter Skelter were written in blood on the refrigerator. And we have some pictures of that up on the website. Um, the words were slightly misspelled. Death to pigs and the word rise were also written in blood on the living room wall. 
After the murders, the offenders hung around. They, in fact, they took showers in the home, ate the LaBianca's food, and then hitchhiked back to Spawn Ranch. While the murders of the LaBianca's was taking place, Manson, Kasabian, Clem, and Atkins had been riding around looking for more victims. Manson gave Kasabian Rosemary LaBianca's wallet and instructed her to wipe off the prints, remove the change, but leave the license and credit cards. His plan was to go to a predominantly African-American neighborhood and Kasabian was instructed to toss it on the sidewalk. He changed his mind at the last minute and they went to a gas station and he told Kasabian to leave the wallet in the women's restroom. Kasabian stated that she was scared and she complied with Manson's orders, although she hid the wallet in a toilet tank. Police actually recovered the wallet four months after the murders. While Kasabian was hiding the wallet, Manson actually got milkshakes for the four of them at a Denny's restaurant located next door to the gas station. Next, Manson told Kasabian they were going to the apartment of the actor Kasabian had recently met and was going to kill him. This man's name was Saladin Nadair. Kasabian had met him on the beach a few days before. Manson stayed in the car and sent the other three to Nadair's apartment. The plan was for Kasabian to knock on the door, and when Nadair answered, they were to slit his throat. But Kasabian went to the wrong apartment, and she later testified in court that she did this on purpose because she didn't want to kill Nadair. When the occupant answered, Kasabian just kind of said, oh, sorry, wrong apartment, and left. This is when Kasabian said that she knew she had to leave the family because she realized that all these innocent people were being murdered. Four days after the murders at the Polanski Tate residence, Bobby Beausoleil is in jail and Manson instructs Kasabian to go to the jail to visit him. But Kasabian had a different plan, and that was to leave. She packed a bag for her daughter. The kids were all kept together, so she went looking to retrieve her daughter, but she was not able to get to her without drawing suspicion, so she left without her. Kasabian told Manson she was going to see Beausoleil, but she fled to New Mexico, leaving her daughter and the Manson family behind. Kasabian had spent a total of four weeks with the Manson family. Shortly after the murders at the Tate Polanski home and of the La Biancas, there was a raid at Spawn Ranch on August 16th of 1969. Numerous law enforcement agents raided the ranch just after 6 a.m. and 25 family members were taken into custody. The warrant had nothing to do with the murders. Police were looking for stolen dune buggies. They were all charged with auto theft, but they were all released because the warrant had been misdated. The children on the ranch were taken into state care. Now, Kasabian at this time comes back to L.A. and is able to retrieve her daughter from the state. She then hid from the family. And then we move forward a little bit further into late August. This takes us to the disappearance of Donald Shorty Shea. Shorty was a Hollywood stuntman, and he was working as a ranch hand. He was last seen sometime around August 25th of 1969. After that raid on Spawn Ranch, Manson ordered the murder of Shorty, who was 35 years old at the time. Manson said Shorty was a rat, and he was working with a neighboring ranch to get the family kicked out of Spawn Ranch. Manson, Bruce Davis... Steve Grogan and Tex Watson drove Shorty to a secluded area where they stabbed him to death. Davis later says he cut Shorty with a knife from collarbone to armpit, and Manson told Davis to cut his head off. So after the raid on Spawn Ranch, the last place Manson and the family ever lived and hid out together was Barker Ranch. They learned about the ranch from Catherine Gillis, who was also a family member. The ranch had been built in the 1930s by Butch and Helen Thomason. During the 50s, it was sold to Arlene Baker, who was an older woman in her late 60s when the Manson family occupied it. Arlene believed that the family was a group of musicians who were looking to rent a space for practice. Manson gave Arlene a Beach Boys gold record as a thank you. 
it's unknown if Manson was given this record by the Beach Boys or if he stole it. The family lived there off and on during 1968 and 1969, and while living on Barker Ranch, they stole dune buggies and vandalized National Park property. Another place commonly frequented by the Manson family was the Myers Ranch that was located about a half a mile from the Barker Ranch. It was a 40-acre recreational ranch in Inyo County that was built in 1932. It was owned by Bill and Barbara Myers and was used recreationally until 1960 when the Myers moved to Fresno, California. On October 10th and October 12th, the police conducted raids on Barker Ranch and Myers Ranch. In October of 1969, a family member was arrested for arson during those raids. Also in October, Susan Atkins was arrested in connection with the Gary Hinman murder. While in jail that November, she began to brag to other female inmates that the family had killed Sharon Tate and her friends and also the LaBianca family. This was, in fact, what broke the case of the brutal murders. On December 1, 1969, the Los Angeles Police Department issued arrest warrants for Patricia Krenwinkel, Leslie Van Houten, Tex Watson, Linda Kasabian, and Charles Manson. This is going to wrap up part two of Manson and the Manson family. In the next episode, we're going to cover the statements of Susan Atkins, the trial, and then we're going to cover life after the trial and what happened to the family members. So make sure to come back to listen to part three. We hope you enjoyed this week's case. And as always, we'll see you next week. We would like to hear your thoughts on this and all of our cases. And as always, you can reach us by email at truecrimeoutloud at gmail.com, Facebook and Instagram at truecrimeoutloud. Outloud is two words, not one, and Twitter at TC Outloud. Photos, links, and sources for this case can be found on our website at www.truecrimeoutloud.com. 